Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Has anybody in here ever read their Bible? A, not the whole Bible, but like a verse. Anybody ever read a verse of the Bible? Okay, that makes you a what? Theologian. A theologian. You are a theologian if you've ever read a scripture. It's the word theology is two words, theos, logos, God's word, or the reading of the word, or God speaking. Anytime you read the word and God speaks to you, it is theology. And so we are doing some theology throughout this series. If you haven't noticed, it's kind of a setup. I'm getting really deep into stuff and I'm making statements that you've never heard before, hopefully that you disagree with, hopefully that rattle your cage, and then you get that like audacious anger and you like go try to prove me wrong. And to set up, it's to get you to read your Bible. It's to get you to study it, right? I told you guys a few weeks ago, I'm, I'm kind of like the guy who likes to throw a rock at a hornet's nest and run away. That's what this series is, is to look at some doctrine and to really try to grasp what is it that you believe. Please don't just bank on eternity because of what you learned in Sunday school when you were five years old. Those are great. We work very hard to make them very real and right. But you need to have a continuous relationship with God. Today's topic is the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ. This is going to be... This is going to be maybe a tough one or a great one or a jaw dropper. First service was really quiet. It was really, really quiet, okay? Does anybody in here know the very first verse of the entire Bible? Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what a fitting start to the Bible. Might as well put in the beginning, in the beginning, as we start. But if we were to take the Bible... And break it all up, all the verses in the whole Bible, and put it in chronological order, in kind of what we would say date order of a story layout, Genesis 1-1 would not be the first book of the Bible. It would not be the first book of the Bible. In fact, the first book of the Bible, if we're looking at it in the story of creation and in the story of God, is John 1-1. Now, let's look at this, okay? John 1-1 says, a lot like Genesis 1-1... In the beginning. Now, I really don't like that term, in the beginning. Because it kind of sets us up for a false impression that God had a beginning. I would love the verse if it looked a little bit different, if it said this. Before time began. Before time began was the word. Or the word already existed. Before time began, the word already existed. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was, in the, he was the same before time began with God. All things were made through him, and without, anything, uh, without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. Okay? Have you guys heard this before? John 1? Some people have memorized all of John 1 because it's such a powerful statement. Now let's go back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness fell over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and God said, let there be light. What light? The light that was light of all men. Back in John 1. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? No? That wasn't cool? Yes? Okay. It is the light. It's the light that God sent through the word, through his son, into the world. It is, God said it. Jesus did it. And, and, and the Holy Spirit was there to ensure, to empower humanity to continue to go. This is what I want you to get. From eternity past, from eternity past, Christ has always existed. Now, I can kind of wrap my mind around never having an end. Because I'm alive, 
And it would be really cool if things like, now hear me out, things like those vampire things were like real, like you get bit by a vampire and you live forever, like 500 years. Like how cool, right? I know my life and imagine I could live for 500 years. Like I can understand forever eternal. I cannot wrap my mind around never having a beginning because everything has a beginning. Everything has a beginning within the construct of time and space. But God operates outside of a place called time and space, and it's called eternity. I can't wrap my mind around that. In fact, I've made myself like mentally sick trying to understand what that would look like and try to, it, it just, you can't understand it. You will never understand never having a beginning. So it makes us simply have faith. I just accept it. I just believe that it is. Before time began, God always existed. And let me tell you, Christ has always been equal, coexisting and co-equal to the Father. The Father did not make the Son. There's this heretic teaching that, you know, well, if there's a father and there's a son, then there has to be a mother because it, no, like, like, why do we bring God down to the level of human understanding? Just read Genesis 126. God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. He made them both male and female. He created them in one being. It wasn't until Genesis 2 that Adam falls into a sleep and he removes the rim and takes the essence of woman out. Right? So no, the father does not need a wife in order to create and be a creator. Yet, he did not have to create his son because his son has always coexisted. Okay, go back and watch the, uh, the, the sermon on Trinity. We do a little bit better job of understanding that. But here, here's what I know. God creates Adam, and then 4,000 years later, Jesus comes to the earth. 4,000 years later. And then it kind of bothers me, like, why so long? Has anybody ever thought that? Like, why so long? Why so long between Adam, the original man who sinned, and the payment for sin? Why so long? And I studied it, and I studied it, and I looked, and I read other theologians, and the best guess, the best guess I can come up with, why 4,000 years later, Adam being around 4,004 BC, Jesus Christ coming to the earth anywhere between 4 to 6 BC, maybe even 1 AD, and then his crucifixion being around 30 to 33 AD, why so long? Could it be because it took that long for humanity to say yes to God's calling and to God's purpose and to God's will? Could it be that it took God that long that he asked, he asked people from day one, hey man, would you do this? Hey, I'm calling you to be a father. Like, how many other people did he ask to be a father of many nations before Abraham said yes? I don't know. It's not in the Bible. Like I said, I'm making all that up. Why 4,000 years? Why the long wait? And I'm just wondering if maybe it's even like a season like today where, like, there is a clergy shortage in America. Why are more people not saying yes to God's calling? And, and, and so we say, well, when's Jesus returning? Not anytime soon. Not anytime soon. There ain't enough people saying yes. There's not people, enough people who want what God's doing. We're like, hey, you know, everything's kind of good. Like, God, we're good. Like, you don't need to come back yet. There's still things I want to accomplish. Come on, somebody. I'm just asking questions. Asking questions about where you are and what God wants to do in the earth today. Here's what we do know. It was around 4,000 years between Adam to the time that Christ stepped out of heaven, 
into human flesh to be the redeemer of mankind. The one who knew how things were supposed to be came to a place where they obviously were not. He came to an earth and a life around these people that was not the way it was supposed to be. Jesus was fully human, conceived in the womb of his mother by a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. This first section, I endeavor to prove that Christ was 100% human. Matthew 8, 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, engaged, before they came together, before they, you know, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. All right? From the Holy Spirit. While many things could be said about this, one thing is clear, that Jesus was born of a human being called Mary. Can we agree on that? That he was birthed by Mary in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. He lived a human life. The Bible talks about that he grew in stature and age. He grew in wisdom. He played as a child. He was found in the temple. But he was supernaturally powered by the Spirit of God. He had a supernatural power. He had the ability to lay hands on the sick and they recover. But what we want to or need to realize is what Romans 8:11 promises us that if the spirit of Christ who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you the spirit of Christ dwells in you the same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you as a believer in Jesus Christ, one who accepts Jesus Christ as the Lord, the same spirit, the same supernatural power that Jesus Christ operated in lives and dwells in you. Now, yes, there is a slight theological difference. We have the spirit with measure. The Holy, the, Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. There is, a, there is a difference in that regard. But it's the same spirit, the same spirit. Jesus died as a man, fully human, paying the price for all men in his body on the cross. And here's, here's where a the, theological difference comes into play as well. We believe that he was also then raised from the dead into his human body, back into his human body, okay? Some churches believe that he was not raised into his human body, but he was raised into a divine body. Then why did his body disappear? Right? It was back into his body, back into his physical body. I like to mess with people who say that it's okay for them to not take care of their current body because one day when I die, I'm going to get a glorified body. Why do you think it's going to look different? Like, no offense, like, you ain't going to be ugly on earth, and then all of a sudden you're beautiful. <laughs> you, can, you can study it out. Jesus returns, and then they're like, oh, no, it's not Jesus. He's dead. And he says, well, look at the scars. Same body. Same body. Now, there's a whole lot of things that happened. He had to ascend and descend, all this kind of stuff, but it was the same body. We get this from John 2.19. We believe this is a literal, a literal tense. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and he's going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. He didn't say, in three days I'm going to build a new body. He said, in three days I'm going to raise this one up. He stepped out of his body, stepped back into the same human body. Now, I don't believe it had yet been glorified um, when he first runs into the disciples and Mary in the garden. He says, wait, don't touch me. I still got things I got to go do, right? 
You can look it up, study it out. He had to be fully human to satisfy the price of sin. To perfectly be, to be a perfect, obedient representative of humanity. Watch this. In Romans 5.19, as by one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, they have been made righteous. Okay? Adam sins. He brings death to the earth. Jesus Christ obeys the Father in a perfect sinless life, therefore can pay the price in his flesh on the cross on Calvary. If Jesus wasn't fully human, his obedience in our place would be meaningless. Understand this. The only difference between Jesus and us is that he lived a sinless life. How did he do that? So that's what, mm, that's the question, right? Like, doggone, if I haven't tried to be perfect, like, for a whole day. <laughs> right? Like, I've tried. I've tried to, like, put on the smile, like, I'm going to have a positive attitude about everything today. I'm not going to have one negative thought. Then you go on Facebook <laughs> or Instagram, right? And you see this person who's been on vacation nine times this year. You're like, vacation again? Like, does this person ever work? <laughs> and then all of a sudden you realize, man, I did it again. I didn't have a perfect day. Didn't have a perfect day. This is just a bad thought. A negative thought about self. Not bearing the image of God. Not a perfect day. How in the world did Jesus, as a kid, not like say no to his mom and go run and take a cookie anyway? <laughs> right? Like never sinned. I don't understand it. It's because he wasn't a descendant of Adam. He wasn't Adam's seed. Remember, like, think about how we said the story went. Mo Mary was the mother. But where did the seed come from? The Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And she became pregnant with the Son of God. Mary's fiance, Joseph, did not impregnate her. You can read that story in Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1. But through the work of the Holy Spirit, inside Jesus' mother, Mary, a human, became pregnant in a very divine way with the person who would be the Christ. So Jesus is not just 100% human. He is also 100% God. He's not 50% human and 50% God. We read a story a few weeks ago about that. That's a Nephilim, right? That became a giant. That, that, that's, that's tainted. It's not correct. He was 100% human, yet 100% God. Look, Colossians 2.9. For in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Clear. In him, the fullness of God is in body, flesh, form in Christ. Jesus was fully God. He's fully man. He was fully both at the same time. So the eternal son of God took to himself a truly human nature. His divine and human natures are forever distinct, yet retain their own properties. That in Christ. I love when I can find things in science that make sense with the Bible. I hate when I feel like I find something in science that then discredits the Bible. But I love it when it works in my favor. I want to make this statement. It was through the egg of female humanity that the divine seed of God created Jesus. Now, I'm talking about procreation. Okay? The female egg and the masculine seed. It was through humanity's egg and God's seed that Jesus Christ came about. And here's what I found in a scientific study. 
A mother's blood does not normally mix with a baby's blood during pregnancy unless there has been procedures done like amniocentesis or coronotic vilus sampling or something along those lines where maybe there's a needle that goes into the embryo to do studies, then possibly it could happen. But in general, a paternity test proves who the father is. A blood test proves who the father is. During delivery, however, there's a good chance that some of the baby's blood cells can enter the mother's bloodstream. That's normal, and it's normally not a problem. But man, I love how science like learns new things all the time. We've learned over the last, I don't know, I don't know how many years we've known this, 10, 20 years, there's this thing called a woman being Rh negative, right? An Rh negative mother will develop antibodies that will attack Rh positive blood. This doesn't often cause problems during the first pregnancy. And there's usually, because there's usually not significant contact between the baby's blood and the mother's blood until they're born. But it has implications on any further pregnancies. If she carries another RH positive baby, her body will produce antibodies which cross the placenta and attack the baby's blood cells. And I just love the fact that Jesus had to be her firstborn child. Like, he had to be the firstborn. There would have been then no way that human blood could taint the sinless blood of Father God in Christ Jesus. And it was this quiet first service. <laughs> like, yo, that's deep. That's deep. Because there's no other way that he could be the spotless Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world if he had Joseph's blood. The sin within the blood. It would have been passed down. And I just, and I, and I love it too. I was thinking about this at breakfast. Like, this could have never happened today. This could never happen in this generation. Because we would have gone right to DNA. DNA, right? And we would have tested, we would have tested the tar out of all this stuff. And then somebody would have lied. Somebody would have made it some kind of sample to something else, and no, nope, it's pig DNA. Whatever. The Bible says that Christ came into the earth at just the right time. At just the right time. That there was a moment of time, a window of opportunity in which he had to come. Anyway. Yo, that's some pretty cool stuff. It was God the Father's blood that flowed through Jesus' veins, a blood that was not touched or tainted by human sin. John 10, verse 1, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by any other way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, this is a type and shadow. If you go through the Bible and you look at different things of types and shadows of what it could mean, this is a type and shadow that if Jesus Christ did not enter the earth through the normal birth canal, he was not a legitimate human. And a legitimate human could not take away the sin of the world. He had to come through the proper doorway. But how did Lucifer, Satan, come to the earth? He was cast out of heaven. He was cast out of him and came to the earth. He's not, he wasn't a child. He was not born of blood and of water, of flesh. He's a thief and a robber. He came to the earth in an illegitimate way. Dude, this is crazy. This is crazy. Jesus came to the earth by natural birth, meaning he came into life the proper way. That's why he can be the way the truth, and the life. No man enters unto the Father but by the door. The door that came in through the door. Wow. 
But as I wrap this up in the next nine minutes, maybe 11. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say he is? Because your answer is going to have implications. Who do you say Jesus Christ is? Because to answer that means that you've come to some knowledge. And to come to some knowledge means that you have to act upon that knowledge. To not act upon that knowledge is to violate your own moral compass. Let alone convicting your own spirit by your consciousness. Jesus comes to his disciples in Matthew 16, 13. And when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, this is called, this is the ESV translation, the English Standard Version. It's very close to the original texts. NLT is another great one. Um, some of the other ones are, are a little far off. But, but let me ask it like this and, and give you some context to maybe how this conversation went outside of how you've heard it taught before. He goes to his disciples and says, who do people say the Messiah is? Who, does, who do people say the Messiah, the Son of Man is? Well, some say John the Baptist is the Messiah. John the Baptist happened to be Jesus' cousin. Some say it's Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Others say the prophets of old. So some say he's here now. Some say he's already come. Some say he came a long time ago. Maybe you've been taught, he said to his disciples, who do you say that I am? Well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist was there. Like, not in the, in the moment, but like, he was still around. Who do you say the Messiah is? John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, the prophets of old. Then he said to them, okay, well, who do you say that I am? And I love that. Because it's kind of a setup. He's asking them the question, but he's giving them the answer. Dude, that's a deep question right there. Who do you say I am? Because he's the I am of I am. He is the I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am was a name. And I love that God's name, Jesus' name, Christ's name is the I am. And that he loves us so much that he's intertwined his name into our name. That before we can ever say our own name, we must first say his name. Really? Hey, what's your name? Oh, I am Jason. I am Michael. He loves us so much that he's intertwined his identity into us. He says, who do you say I am? Peter looks at him. Peter looks at him and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I could almost feel like the earth rumble when he said it. It probably wasn't that dramatic, but I could just, you know, envision it. And Jesus said to him, like, this is what I see, like, it's like theatrical. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barge. Like, I would love to. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He's saying, this was not by general revelation. This is not open knowledge to everybody. You see that I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. By special revelation. God himself has opened your eyes to see this truth. And then he speaks something into him. And now he prophesies. And I say unto you, you know my name, but you don't know yet. No, you do not yet know what your name means. You do not yet know what I've created you to be. He says, you have revelation, but I got revelation about you. Yes, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, but you are Peter. Or he says, you are Petra. Petra meaning pebble. 
You are Petra. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And many believe that they were saying like, Jesus was going to build his church on Peter, and blah, blah, blah. He, he didn't. The rock that he's talking about is the earth. The rock of the earth. Upon this rock, upon this earth, I will build my church. But Peter, the pebble, you are the rock. Your revelation of who I am is going to be the chief cornerstone of the church. Pebble, I will use you on this rock to build the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Keys represent authority. Keys represent dominion. Go back in your Bible and look at when God created man, it said that God created him in his image and after his likeness. And the very next verse says, and he gave him dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and any creature that crept on the ground, he gave him dominion. And God created man, it says. He created him to have dominion, to rule and reign. And in this moment, at this idea of revelation, he's saying, I'm going to raise victorious and give you this dominion back. I wonder how many of us are still not operating in kingdom authority, are still not operating at the, the dominion that God gave us to live in this life. He says, I've given you the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Question for you today is this, who do you say he is? Who, who is this Christ to you? Because if he is who the Bible says he is, if he is who Peter says he is, if he is that, then there's some things about me that has to now align with that truth. That's why people don't want to know truth. They don't want to know what other people believe. Throw this out of there is no God. But if there is, and he is the Christ, then it demands something of me. It means that there's a creator and that he created my life for a specific purpose. And if that be the case, then I owe it to myself and everyone else in this world to find out what that purpose is and complete it before the dash of my life comes to an end. Between my birth date and my death date, there's a line of purpose. There's a line of purpose that must be completed. There's a book that needs to be published. There's a story that needs to be told. There's a legacy in th that needs to be passed on. There's a recipe that needs to be cooked. Thank you, Jesus. There's purpose. Who is this Christ to you? And to get that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says that we need to believe in our heart, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. And you shall be saved. That means you now are a covenant right to what God has provided for us through his son. A covenant right. A relational right. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus Christ, to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved, to, to really confess what Peter said, I believe you are the Christ. Well, I want to offer that to you today. And we do that by doing a prayer, saying a prayer. And that prayer goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Savior of my life. Jesus, I accept you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. 
you can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.